bit and um, you know just some general personal thoughts around the amp and uh, in the second part we're actually going to do some service work on it this is my own personal amp I highly encourage you to watch part one of this series first it would make the story go much much better at any rate, one of the things we noticed yesterday when I got into this amp was at some point in time over the years, I had replaced these screen resistors here. They basically go from the pin 3 of one of the 7591s um, into pin 4 of the other, which is the uh, grid 2 or otherwise known as screen. Um, and likewise on this one, uh, the plate would go into... Uh, grid two over here screen so you kind of got these things in parallel between the two push pull tubes here and um, what happens is when you have a tube go out typically a um, uh, good bit of the time I've seen um, it blows this resistor here and these resistors uh, from the factory here you can see are uh, probably quarter watt um, resistors and they were originally designed to uh, actually blow um, instead of uh, you know, um, affecting the uh, transformers themselves. So what we're going to do this morning is I'm a, uh, if you notice this thing had two watt resistors in there, I probably did that at some point in time over the years when I, when I lost some output tubes and had to get this thing running again and uh, that was all I had on hand. But really I'm going to go back with some, uh, some smaller resistors here. Um, these resistors I get in a kit. Um, they come, they are, uh, these individual little bags and they're in numerical sequence and there's about uh, 10 in a pack uh, fairly inexpensive you can pick them up off of Amazon or whatnot but it's, uh, I used to use the blue bins that you see everyone's using to hold resistors and I found you just eat up a lot of space this little box right here would actually completely fill up a, a great big um, blue bin with about uh, oh what maybe um, 80 or 90 different little bins on it um, so I moved to these little boxes and uh, as I as I get over at least halfway through one of those little packs of using resistors I'll make notes up here on the top of the ones that I've used um, and need to reorder restock whatnot uh, and I've got these boxes in all different sizes not a, not a bad way to go but what I'm doing here if you notice I've uh, hooked up the Fluke 8060 uh, true RMS uh, multimeter to one of the resistors and I'm just making sure that this thing is uh, um, is uh, correct there. Um, you just never know um, when you um, get some resistors or whatnot whether the uh, color coding on them is right or whatnot. So I always just like to check and if they're within a percent or two um, which these are actually 1% uh, metal films and this does look to be within 1% or so. I might try to find one a little closer to the 68 ohm that this should be um, and I'm going to put these in here real quick and uh, we'll be right back. And welcome back. Um, I think this part of the video should be pretty entertaining or at least uh, <laughs> it may be educational if not at least entertaining because um, I don't I don't see a lot online around this. Uh, it's probably something guys in the 50s were good at. You still see a lot of guitar. Mostly if you do search for this type of info, you find it on guitar forums. These Bumblebee capacitors were fairly uh, popular in a lot of the older um, uh, Les Paul guitars and uh, various uh, vintage equipment. So anyway, what this is, is it's a chart from Sprague who made these Bumblebee capacitors. And it kind of tells you how to go about uh, deciphering um, the color coding on a resist, I mean, on a capacitor here. And if you notice the uh, color scheme here, it looks very familiar. It's very similar to a uh, to the capacitor chart. Uh, just a little bit different in the way that the uh, the tolerance is handled and the voltage rating, some of that type of stuff. So I'm going to show you, walk you through this thing uh, from one end to the other, and uh, so it'll be somewhat of an educational piece on uh, mapping out uh, Sprague Bumblebee capacitors. So. Let's take a look here at the first one that we're going to do. If you'll notice here, um, this is a, a, a um, capacitor that goes across part of the uh, power supply components. And um, these are actually some uh, kind of snubber caps or noise filters. Um, you see the other one over here that matches the exact same color. But really what they're designed to do is kind of keep noise off of these two diodes right here. Um, so. Let's check out what they are. Um, 
So if you notice the color on this one, it's kind of hard to see here. But we'll start down here with the big one first. That's, that's typically uh, where you see the big wide one first. It's always the first one in the series. Um, that's a brown color. You look at the next color and it kind of looks gray and you're going, hmm, is that gray or what color is that? You notice the third color is orange and the fourth color is kind of gray. Um, and then you got a blue. And um, if, you, if you've worked with these before, you notice that there's always a space between the ones clumped together and that blue one. Um, the blue one is uh, usually the voltage value down there at the end. So um, if you come back over here and you're trying to figure out if that's gray or not, and you look at this, you kind of say, okay, um, the first one here is brown. So that's your first figure. Um, we come over here and we know that that's going to be a one. And then the second figure, that might be a uh, brown. Um, not sure. Um, or it might be a gray, which would be an eight. One eight. Hmm. Seems a little odd to me, but we'll keep going with it here. Um, then you got the number of zeros, and then if you remember, that was orange, so we've got three zeros here. And then you get to the tolerance, which happened, if you notice, um, if that was gray, then the, the second one was gray, then the fourth one was gray, because they look the same on the resistor. And you come back over here and you say gray for the fourth one is tolerance, and hmm, that's blank. It's so leading me to believe that that color is not gray. Um, keep in mind, these things are 50 years old almost right now. A little older than I am. Um, so what I've came to the conclusion is that's not gray. That's actually black. That's just uh, kind of turning a little black. So, um, so if you come back over here then and you go brown, black, orange, black. So you end up then um, with brown, which is one, black, which is zero, orange, which is add three zeros, black again, which if you come back up here, makes sense. It's 20%. And then blue is just indicated by a number here six and um, they don't add the zeros on the end so you just you assume from that it's 600 um, sometimes there'll be two colors here as it shows for the voltage rating like let's say this was a one and a two um, then that would be 1200 but if it only has one color there um, it's your primary leading and you just uh, know that that's 600 so anyway the way you go about this is um, you take your one and your zero and you add three zeros after it, which gets you here to one zero and three zeros, 10,000 picofarads. And if you know how to do the math here, you move three zeros to the left and three more to the left here to get this into microfarads instead of pico or nanofarads. Um, and when you move to the left here, you have to add a zero to get your decimal then. You end up with 0 0.01000000. Equals to 0.1 microfarads at 600 volts. Um, just FYI, they, this is uh, C24 and C25, which on the schematic right here you can see um, is really just designed to help keep noise off of those um, the two um, diodes up here. And just doing some research online, um, reading. Uh, a lot of guys replace these here with just um, the metalized uh, polyester film capacitors. They're, they're not part of the audio circuit, in other words. So um, probably a 630 volt um, uh, polyfilm capacitor is what I will put there in that place. So, like I say, it's not part of the audio circuit whatsoever. It's part of the power supply. Um, next, we're going to spin this thing around. Let you get a good look in here. And then here are the four... Um, primary things that we're trying to replace. These are the four Bumblebee capacitors directly in line with the audio path. Um, I think between the 12 AU7 and the 12 BH7s. Um, any rate, notice the color. Yellow, violet, orange. Then we got that kind of gray, which um, actually turns out to be um, black. And then we've got blue again. So we come back over here, C8, 9, 18, and 19. Um, yellow, which translates to four up here on our little chart. Purple, which trend or violet, which translates to seven. Orange, which is the third one, which we come back up here and it says in the third spot, tells us to add three zeros. You notice right here in the third spot, number of zeros. And then the fourth one is black, and we did that before. We noticed that black over here means 20% tolerance. Um, blue again gives us 600 volts, the same kind of thing. We had four zero, three z 47 with three zeros after it. Those are in picofarads. 
we moved the decimal to the left um, 123 to get to nanofarads 123 to get to microfarads which leaves us with 0 0.47 microfarads at 600 volts is what these are rated and we'll come back around here in a minute on that if you'll notice um, all four of these you got c19 c18 here and really what they do here um, is they kind of go between, like I said, the 12AU7s here um, and these 12BH7s over here. Um, same here with C9 and same thing here with C8. So I'll show you what we're going to replace those with here in a minute. And then um, let's swing around here. The next two are here on the um, balanced input and they actually go to the uh, mono stereo switch here. But if you notice the color looks like brown black, yellow, black, red. Um, so C1 and C2, if you'll notice them here on the schematic, like I said, here's the stereo mono switch. They go between the inputs, the input um, potentiometers here that help out. Um, by the way, one thing to note about that Macintosh amps with these input potentiometers, um, if you have a phono amp of some sort, you can feed directly into this thing you really don't need a preamp. You can use this for your volume control. Nine out of ten times preamps, uh, if you're using discrete components, are just used kind of as a buffer stage with a volume control. So you can get that right here. So uh, you could run a funnel amp in front of this, run it to your turntable, and be good to go. Or you could go directly into this thing from a uh, CD player if you wanted, or maybe your iPod or whatnot. Um, so coming back over here, C1, C2. Um, we had said, if you'll remember here, brown, black, yellow, black, red. Brown being one, black being zero, yellow being four. If you notice here, four number of zeros. Um, then we got still the black again, 20%. Red equals, if you'll notice up here, uh, red is a two. So that's 200 volts. Um, and then we got, you know, the uh, 100,000 picofarads, move the decimal, you end up with a 0.1 microfarad 200 volt capacitor. And hang on one second and I'll be right back with what we're going to replace these with. And we're back. So remember yesterday in the previous video I mentioned I probably have to order some stuff. Well, turns out I really didn't. Um, if you look at this, these are some uh, 0.01 microfarad 400 volt. Um, and actually I meant to grab the 600 volt bag. I will go back and uh, and uh, get those out of the other room. But you get the point. These are some metalized uh, polyester film capacitors. It's what I'm going to put um, up here in both this spot right here and this spot right here for the power supply um, capacitors. I mean, uh, for the power supply section to uh, get noise off those diodes. Um, and then we get to next in the list are these uh, 0 0.47 600 volts and guess what I had uh, many many bags of these are old um, Russian paper and oil I'm not sure how many years old these things are but man they last forever because they're sealed inside of a glass case um, but I've got some in green these are 0 0.47 630 volt K42 dash Y2s um, and they happen to have a green uh, case to those. I um, also have here just the uh, plain old K40-9.047 uh, uh, 630 volt um, Russian paper and all. These are probably the ones I'm going to use. Um, I actually used to have a good amount of these. I'm getting fairly low on them. And that's why I ordered some more and I couldn't find these at a good price. So, um, ended up getting these uh, K42s, which are really good capacitors as well. But um, if you notice, I store all my capacitors and whatnot in these little Ziploc bags. I buy them by the thousand. Uh, they're fairly cheap. Um, and then once I uh, put them in this, I put them inside of bins. Um, a whole lot easier than the little plastic metal um, blue cabinets with drawers that you used to use. Just a whole lot more space efficient as well. Um, and then finally here, if we come over here to the uh, to the C1, C2, um, 0.1 microfarad at 200 volts. I didn't have any 200 volts. So I got the 630 volt. 
And you, you probably know this already, but you can always go higher with the voltage rating. Um, the only downside to going with a much higher voltage rating is typically the device itself uh, component gets bigger. So if this was a, maybe a 400 volt or a 300, 200 volt, it would be much smaller in size. And so sometimes you run into physical limitations as to why you can't use a higher voltage, but um, it doesn't hurt to have a higher voltage rating than, uh, than less. So um, at least now you know what I'm going to put inside this thing. And uh, I'm going to get busy doing the soldering here. So um, if you want to just hang with me for a little bit, uh, maybe go get a drink or something. I'm going to pause this thing and uh, we'll be back. You can uh, you can see what happened as a result. Oh, one thing. Um, this board here, all along here, it's um, it's almost a turret style board um, of a vintage style. Uh, stuff mounted on both sides of it, but it's kind of hard to see from here, but on the other side here, there is, uh, let's see, right there's one of them, another screw, another screw, and another screw. There's four screws along the top. You take those out, this board comes loose, and you gives you a little bit of wiggle room to, to kind of turn it around, turn it over, so you're doing soldering uh, not way down here against the uh, board, and these wires getting in the way, so that's what we're going to do next, and we'll be back shortly. Okay, and we are back. If you'll notice, I have now replaced these uh, 2.1 microfarad 200 volt uh, bumblebee capacitors that were on the inputs. They go between the middle wiper on the two input potentiometers, and they go down to the uh, stereo uh, mono switch here. And um, one thing you'll notice is that's all I have done at this point. Um, the reason for that, I'm a big believer, and uh, it's just, just trial and error I've learned over the years. I only touch, I kind of break an amp apart into kind of a block diagram, um, and I only touch one part of it at a time. So right here I'm playing around with the input um, on this thing, and I'm um, just going to replace these two capacitors. I'm going to plug the amp in, um, hook it up, um, and make sure everything's working right before moving on to um, you know, the next step, which will be um, replacing the four bumblebee capacitors over here, and which is all part of the uh, small tube audio path. And then the third thing, and the third part of my block diagram in my head um, <laughs> would be the ones part of the power supply. But like I said, I'm just gonna do um, uh, one section at a time, test it out in between, because I've made the mistake before, and I see I've seen others do it. Now they jump into something like this, and they replace ten or twelve components, and they uh, woohoo, I'm done. They hook it up, some doesn't work right, and then they're kind of left going, well, which part of what did I just replace uh, is causing this thing to malfunction? So um, much easier to trace things down step by step. I'm just a real logical thinker like that, and uh, I like to break my work down into pieces. And um, it should help with uh, troubleshooting diagnostics. Plus, hey, guess what? I can tell the effects of just the changing these two at this point if there were any uh, positive or negative uh, effects from doing so. So we'll be right back. I'm going to hook this thing up and listen to it. Um, probably won't run a sound wave through it, and I'll show you that here in just a second. All right, so now we've got the, uh, the amp hooked up. Remember I said I just replaced these two pieces? And I plan to, um, to do a little testing before replacing anything else. A couple things here. If you'll notice um, the uh, banana plugs, remember how I told you how easily they, they plugged right in and out of these, uh, these connectors, nice and solid and strong. Um, in this case, the blue is considered black for me, because if you notice over here, blue connects into black. And the green is red for me, and if you'll notice over here, green goes into red, and these are kind of segmented off into pairs. Um, if you notice, this one's labeled R on it, so that's my right pair, and this is my left pair. And they just feed around here and come into the amp. From there, they go up into my dummy load setup, which is then going to feed lots of other pieces of equipment coming out of these BNC connections. Um, another piece coming out of the 8903B audio analyzer coming down here, feeding into a terminal block um, with that 600 ohm uh, dummy load there to terminate this uh, uh, feedback. 
We've then come out a VNC connector into a VNC to RCA connector, an RCA splitter, which then comes up in here into the left and right channel. So it's really a mono output from the uh, audio analyzer, and I'm just bringing it down and bringing it into the um, into the Macintosh here. So you're basically getting the exact same signal into this thing. Um, the way I've got the audio analyzer set up right now, um, it's basically you know frequency. 1000 hertz uh, and then amplitude here um, I'm going to go with 0.2 volts on this thing and right now I've got my speakers switched to uh, dummy load so you'll notice if I flip that all of a sudden you get the 1000 hertz tone a little reading over here on the right if you notice I've got it set on distortion so right now we're running at 0 0.08 distortion which is a uh, great great figure on the output of this thing and similarly we can pick, slip the other channel to uh, to speaker but for right now to keep from killing our ears I'm going to put it back on dummy load and all that switch does is take the left or right channel and uh, switches between the resistors and the output the, the um, bookshelf speakers that I've got sitting up on top if you notice coming out of this little output jack I go into the uh, Red BNC, which is channel A on my oscilloscope, and you can see here a very beautiful sine wave at this point in time. Um, feed down from that, got an, uh, another NIST calibrated item here. It's a, uh, it's a Tektronic uh, frequency counter, and it is showing exactly 1,000 hertz, uh, 1 kilohertz. We come over here to the uh, 3582 uh, 20 year uh, fast transform um, FFT uh, spectrum analyzer and if you'll notice the little marker here is running uh, this little switch here kind of moves the marker along left and right uh, you can barely see it down at the bottom I'm spinning it right and left but as I get it up it goes up on top of that little peak there you see the little glowing dot and what it tells me is it's spot on at 1000 hertz but what's not showing here is what's really amazing. If you come down and come along, there's really no harmonic. Um, there's no secondary bumps. Um, you know, usually you'll see one around 3,000 hertz, which will be your first um, even order um, uh, harmonic. Maybe another one at 5,000 or so. Um, things of that nature. But it's fairly quiet. And I am running this amp at fairly low power right now. Um, we could come over here and hit um, amplitude 1.0 volts. Uh, as you can see, my oscilloscope spikes way up. I have to turn that back down. Um, and if I come over here then, one of the things, this first one has gone way off scale now. Um, I'll tell you that. So uh, I have to kind of bring it back down. And when, once I get it back down, there's really no little second bumps. If I take the first one way off scale, um, which it doesn't represent well, because it keeps going on way on up beyond that, um, but way down here, um, you start to see that second um, little bump there, and that's at three millivolts. Um, whereas you get back over here on this one, and it's, uh, like I say, you're, uh, you're way off scale when you get to this one. Uh, that one we're running it right at. Uh, and what it looks like. So, at any rate, um, let's bring it back around. One thing I was going to show you, uh, I found interesting a minute ago. Let me quieten that down just a little bit here. Amplitude point two volts. And put that back on. And we hear a nice sound now. I don't you see if you can hear this or not, but. Hear the popping and crackling noises in here as I turn the uh, input potentiometers. It means these things are just uh, um, they got some dirt in them and I got some age to them. So we're gonna clean those out real quick. If you'll notice here, um, top of every potentiometer, you can usually find a uh, little space there. But real quick, I'm going to shut this thing off because I don't ever do work on a live amp here. Um, I'll be right back. Okay, we're back. So um, 
this Deoxit F5, it's uh, often called fader lube, um, is what I'm going to use to clean these two potentiometers on the front end. Kind of high quality audio um, type potentiometers within the audio signal path. And um, so I use, I use this stuff on uh, either balance controls or um, uh, tone controls, things of that nature. Um, I also make the uh, plain deoxid D5, which the D5 stands for 5% chemical in this thing. You can actually get deoxid 100, I think, but uh, uh, stay away from that. It might uh, might do more damage than good in my hands. Um, anyway, I use this for a lot of uh, connections with inside of, um, such as um, you know, switches or maybe just um, sometimes uh, potentiometers of various types or whatnot. Um, and then um, sometimes I just use a plain old, uh, you can buy this about any uh, um, auto parts store or whatnot. It's just good electronic contact cleaner. So I use that just as it shows here between uh, connectors, uh, maybe relays, things of that nature. Just an all around good contact cleaner. And then lastly, the other thing I use sometimes, uh, not that frequently, but uh, it's just a good electronics lubricant. Where this comes in handy is where you have a, uh, a physical connection, uh, where you've got bearings or whatnot. So think about inside of an FM tuner, you've got, a, um, you've got an airspace capacitor there. Well, on each end of that, you've got little bitty uh, places where you've got a shaft going through metal um, and could use a little bit of lubrication. Sometimes on the, uh, the routes for um, your... your um, your tuning indicator string on a um, on a um, on a tuner or whatnot. You'll have some places there with little bearings and whatnot. This is really good stuff just to squirt in there. To uh, one, it uh, it lubricates, but if it happens to get into your electrical path somehow, um, it it doesn't cause issues like some of your other lubricants, um, WD-40 or others might would. So, at any rate, what we're going to do here, if you'll notice on the top of the potentiometers here. Um, You've got always got an opening up here where the um, where the blades go down in there, and so we'll just give it a good uh, spray in there, and similarly on this other one, and then what we'll do is grab these things and just go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, and it just kind of removes. A lot of times, what what happens is you get a, just get a, a surface layer on top of the uh, carbon. Um, boards inside of these things, just a, a layer of oxidiz oxidization, oxidization. Any rate, um, going back and forth runs the wiper over that with the, with the um, fader lube in there. It kind of removes that stuff and uh, just cleans it up very nicely. Okay. I just wanted to grab a paper towel here and wipe up uh, where any excess of this may have gone inside the amp. And let's plug it back up and see if we still have that uh, See if we still have that sound when the, the amp comes back on here. You'll notice the uh, crackling is gone. So success on that. I'm uh put those volume controls back off. I'm really happy with how this piece of the uh, the upgrade uh, turned out. Uh, didn't seem to affect the input whatsoever. A beautiful, nice, clean. Um, sine wave here um, there's no clipping whatsoever i'll turn this thing up a good little bit three point volts um, still you know just a beautiful signal on this thing um, even with it turned up a good bit there um, so, at any rate, um, really happy with how this thing's turning out. 
We're going to pause here and replace some more parts and come back to you here shortly. Hold tight. Okay, it's tip tip time again. Um, keep thinking of these things as I go along the way, but um, let me slide this back here in the light a little bit. I'm going to show you this is the bottom of this electrolytic capacitor or similar over here. Um, usually when I turn an amp off, I let it sit a few minutes because most of them will have some type of bleeder resistors installed to uh, bleed off the uh, voltage inside these capacitors. In my warning screen, you'll notice it says that uh, danger, high voltage, and uh, <laughs> it also tells you that uh, this voltage uh, may be there with the amp plugged in and turned on. It may be there for days and days on the end, um, even with the amp. Um, turned off and the power cord from this uh, Macintosh amp removed. Could stay in there for you know a day or two or three um, if there's nothing there to bleed off these capacitors. And then all of a sudden you go to do some work and you reach down in here and your finger touches one of those leads and another part of your body happens to be touching uh, the chassis. And uh, you know it's one thing if part of your finger here was on this metal like this and then it touched that thing. You basically short from the end of your finger back to your uh, wherever it was touching this metal. That's one thing. Another thing is when you have your hand over here on the chassis doing something, and then your finger touches that thing. Well, guess what becomes the circuit at that point in time? Uh, flows out your uh, finger here, goes around your arm, in through your body, straight through your heart, <laughs> and out to your other arm and comes out the other side where it's touching this chassis over here. That's why you hear there are a lot of rules around um, only one hand in the chassis at all times. Matter of fact, if you can't can't be good about that, sit on your other hand when you're working on an amp. Um, sometimes that's just uh, it sounds sounds great on uh, paper or in my video, but it's kind of impractical when you're actually working on something to solve or something because you may have to be holding a lead of something with one hand while you're touching the other with the soldering iron. Um, so it makes it kind of tough. So. What do you do to make sure that these capacitors are completely dead? A um, couple ways to go about it. Say I usually let the amp sit for a while. They typically bleed, bleed off fairly well on their own. Another way to go about it is just get a screwdriver. Um, and a lot of guys don't like this approach, um, but you kind of take the uh, chat, hit it to one side of the chassis, and then touch it against the uh, the uh, high voltage uh, connection to the capacitor there, and make sure it's good and shorted out. Similarly, come over here and touch the chassis here, and you uh, kind of touch the capacitor there and make sure it's completely dead. And I've already done the one on the other side. A lot of guys will take and uh, make a little uh, little jig, per se. Um, when they don't have an alligator clip, they'll clip it somewhere like right here. Then it'll have a little cable, and it'll have a resistor in that, and then another alligator connector that you connect to it and put a fairly low um, um, resistance um, resistor in there, maybe a hundred ohm or something, and touch it. And you just basically clip it on there and leave it a minute. And you're basically putting in place a bleeder resistor at that point in time. Um, usually, you know, the fact I let them sit a little while and bleed off mostly on their own, and then I do the uh, little screwdriver thing. Um, I've, I've, I've been doing it for 30 years and never damaged an amp. So uh, I get the other may be a uh, little bit safer practice. But the, the only downside to doing this is if that thing was completely charged and you did that, you just create a, a, a big inrush of current directly between that connection and ground. Um, you probably cause a little bitty spot on your chassis here where it does a little bit of what would be considered spot welding. Um, and uh, like I say, it's just rough on the capacitor. But, um, but like I say, I usually let them bleed down quite a good bit before ever doing such a uh, such a move. And uh, like I've I've waited here a good five or ten minutes before I ever touch that thing. So either way you want to go about it, I'm just telling you how I do it. And um, like I say, I've never had any issues in 30 years of doing that. But um, there are other ways, and I just want to make you aware. I'm going to, um, now that this thing's dead, I'm going to get the soldering iron uh, out and I uh, cannot video and solder at the same time. It's just uh, not practical and it's not safe. So uh, you'll see this post the soldering. All right. I flipped the amp over. As you can see, I've removed the uh, larger output tubes. And as you can see here along the way, I have removed the four screws. Um, you see how shiny this chassis is. Beautiful, beautiful amp. Um, and what I'm going to do is use a uh, toothbrush here to... Uh, kind of clean up around those spots because uh, 
when else are you going to get your amp completely clean other than when you uh, other than when you um, have all the screws out of it or whatnot but clean that up a little bit and uh, now that I've got that out I'm gonna go ahead and flip it back upside down here um, and like I said I mentioned this board once you get that loose then you got it, it the board does not come out because it's uh, as you can see all these wires come straight off the board here and uh, go to the sockets but what you got is just a little bit of wiggle room here to be able to work with that thing at this point so I'm gonna get these bumblebee capacitors replaced and uh, we'll show you a little more as we go okay. along I want to show you a little more here so I went about getting these things off and uh, if you flip it around to the other side here it might be kind of tough to see but um, the wires coming through into this part of the amp right here where these two come in it is impossible to get underneath there and snip the wire on the this side of the board um, without removing resistors and whatnot first so a little trick i've learned over time is if you come to the other side and as close to the board as you can get you kind of snip um, these little things off as close as you can get then you have to get um, down in there a little bit with your screwdriver you might have to push those little leads that are left just a little bitty part sticking through that's probably a uh, less than a sixteenth of an inch uh, sticking through there um, you basically have to snip those uh, or push those down so that they get out of the way um, and at that point in time you can make room uh, believe it or not you can actually push one of these things all the way through and uh, make you a nice little seat there and then what you have to do is come to the other side here and basically bend those leads up and around and like I said I like to make a physical connection which I'm not going to do with the camera in my hand but at least that shows you you just got to make room inside of these little holes as they come through because those other leads will get in the way um, we'll bend these up we'll solder them in place but that's how I go about um, getting these things through these uh, old turret style boards real quick here if the camera will focus enough if you'll notice that lead that came through I brought it around, I bent it up over and back down around this thing before I soldered it. So what I've got there is, is this thing coming through the other side and then it's been up around and tightly pulled so that it makes a physical connection, not just the solder holding it in. And you might can see down at the bottom, I'm not sure here, but I've done very similar and I'm getting ready to solder these two pieces. I just wanted to show you that first, uh, how big a fan I am on... Uh, the physical aspects of the wire holding in place and not uh, just running that through there dropping a bead of solder on it and hoping that the solder holds it in place and as you can see it is nicely soldered in here now um, both at the top and at the bottom uh, it's a bit shinier than the older solder that was in place uh, it's not 50 years old and at this point i can come over here and kind of align this thing up really nice and neat because i know it's physically connected and boy did that not turn out neat right there okay we're gonna move on down the line and get the other pool going and um, keep showing you as we go okay at this point as you can see we've installed the four new large bottle um, 7591a electro harmonix tubes we've also put back in place our screws here that hold that bottom board i spin this thing around if you notice i use uh this is actually a cooking board it's uh Teflon or whatnot. I use it for most stuff. It slides around real easy. I can spin it real easy. Uh, makes makes manhandling a uh, big amp like this really tough. But because of the beauty of this amp and paint involved, I've also laid down a white towel here that uh, keep from scratching up anything on the uh, on the chassis. If you'll notice here, uh, hang on a second here. We now have the uh, four. K40 um, Russian 0 0.047 630 volt capacitors soldered in place, nice and neatly tucked, um, like I say, wrapped around and soldered well on the top. And we're ready to do some testing if you uh, if you want to. If you notice, I've hooked all the connections back up here, and we're going to do just a little bit of testing on this thing. Um, let me reach down here to the uh, the Variac and turn it on um, get 120 volts flow into this thing and then up here I'm going to um, get the uh, HP 8903B going as well 
Um, give me just a second here for it to warm up. And as you can hear, it's pretty loud. I'm going to flip it over to dummy load so we don't have to listen to it. Any rate, you can see here, um, just a beautiful sine wave. Um, and I'm going to crank up the amplitude a little more. Um, um, to the point that this thing is uh, it's clipping, but it's clipping on the oscilloscope, not the actual. <laughs> in other words, it's overdriving what my scope can do at this point in time. Uh, but that's at about full power out. Um, uh, yeah, overdriving the input trace of the uh, oscilloscope there. But um, one's not the amp clipping. The other thing I'm going to do, just for grins and giggles, I'm going to disconnect from the 8903. It pretty much only generates a sine wave. Um, got an output here, frequency generator, and then you got the input on the other side here um, that it takes all the um, readings from. If you notice, um, right now, distortion-wise, we're running at 1,000 hertz. Um, Amplitude-wise, um, 0.2 volts. And we're running at 0.08% distortion right now. But I'm going to disconnect this and uh, I'm going to go over here to a uh, WaveTech um, frequency generator that I use some. It's not as precise that uh, 8903 goes down to a pretty low level of distortion. But for what I'm wanting to do right now, I'm, I'm really not all that concerned with um, my input signal. But see here, um, we, can, uh, we can change that thing from, uh, let's see, there we go. So we can change it from um, um, a sine wave to a square wave. And you can see there's just a slightest little hint of ripple there at the very, very top where that thing overshoots just by the teeniest bit. But let me tell you, um, I have seen many, many amps <laughs> way worse than this. This is about as good as you get. Pretty solid square wave. Any slope uh, degradation here is... Um, Probably got more to do with the um, uh, tuning capacitance of the cables I'm using and not the actual sine wave itself. So this thing's pretty darn solid. And uh, you know, as I play it on up at uh, 10 kilohertz or whatnot, this thing's still pretty solid. Um, we can crank it on up here. We're at 20 kilohertz right here. I mean, um, we're maintaining a beautiful, perfect sine wave at 20 kilohertz. Um, really can't ask for much more. I'll, uh, I'll hook up the uh, Peat Mellet software and show you a little bit of the uh, 8903 and some of the software functionality it can do next. But this is just a quick and dirty uh, quick check. We'll hit the software. Um, then we'll also, let me turn on the uh, 3582 Spectrum Analyzer. We'll also then um, uh, hook up some music to this thing let you hear it a little bit. Okay, back over here on the uh, 3582 Spectrum Analyzer, and as you can see, <laughs> there is really nothing beyond the primary signal that's pegged right there. You can see that is exactly at 1 kilohertz, uh, 6.2 volts right here. Um, really nothing over here to read. <laughs> it's about as clean as you'll ever get an amplifier, in my opinion. Um, let me turn this thing off because it makes a lot of noise and uh, I'm happy with the results thus far. And I'm going to jump into the, uh, jump into the uh, software a little bit. Okay, what we started up this time is the Peat Mellet software called Frequency Response. And what it maps is frequency on the bottom axis and uh, dB level on the left. So basically it's showing you as this thing um, goes across um, in frequency as it as it plays a tone all the way from 20 Hertz all the way up to uh, 20 kilohertz here um, you know how flat is the frequency response of this amp and you can see the blue line and the yellow line here completely flat at 0 DB I mean this is as close to a perfect amplifier as I have ever seen um, typically you got raising going on up here which means uh, the thing really um, is down a little bit, can't can't display 20 hertz completely, so you, you kind of have this slope-in effect 
um, where you got a, a, a lower signal level coming out, comes in, comes across, and then you start to die off as you get up here around 20 kilohertz. Uh, in other words, the amplifier just can't produce um, the 20 kilohertz signal as strong as it can uh, the rest of it, so it starts to dip down a little bit. So you kind of end up with this bell curve type, type shape, um, not with the Macintosh 225. So you want to get into the technical specs of why this amp is one of the best, you know, claimed as one of the best sounding amps ever made. This is it. Um, and this flat response comes from not only the circuit design, but these um, output transformers in these Macintoshes. Um, you can build the same circuit and use different iron and get, get a lot of different results um, from this. So this is why they're coveted and uh, why if you get an opportunity to pick one up, you should. I'm going to stop the software at this point and go back. Um, still have not completed the amp. I've still got the uh, two power supply uh, noise um, gaps there I'm going to replace. And uh, we'll be back showing you that in just a second. All right. We've finished soldering in the uh, 0 0.01 microfarad 600 volt capacitors. Um, if you notice, I put one in over here and one in right here, just exact same spot that the originals were in. And if you remember earlier, I had um, I had these laid out, but then I realized, hey, I'd pulled out some 400 volt ones, and I thought I had some 630s, but I didn't. But what I did have was some good old uh, spray orange drops uh, in the 0 0.01 600 volts. And since these are not in the audio path, um, we went ahead and uh, put these in. Just for reference, the reason I went ahead and tested the audio out earlier was because all these capacitors that we... Uh, that we replaced these bumblebees with the uh, the Russian uh, paper and oils were in the audio signal pad. So before I went any further, I wanted to make sure the audio sounded good. Um, we'll do one final check now to make sure everything still sounds great. And let's hook some music up to this thing and see how it sounds. All right, we've got an audio signal running into this thing. And it's pretty much uh, one kilohertz. Um, let's see, see low uh, 0.1% distortion at the level we're running it at right now, 0 0.8, um, 0 0.08, I'm sorry, <laughs> way down there. Um, beautiful sound wave, about as clean as you could ever want coming out of this thing. Um, you come over here and do a spectrum analyzer and there's really no secondary harmonics. I can actually crank this thing up a notch till I get to where um, I'm starting to get, you can see, here as you move across the little trace and get it on that next little bump. You have 2 kilohertz. Right there on top of 3 kilohertz, there's a teeny little bump. If you'll notice this line here, it continues way up here. Because if you'll notice, it's telling me overload on that. So basically, if I get it back down here to where I'm within scale, there really is no secondary bump here. And if I switch this thing across down to the wave tech unit here, uh, turn that thing on at uh, 1 kilohertz itself. Uh, let's see. Alright, sorry I had a loose cable connection. Um, anyway, still a beautiful sine wave here. We come over here, still a little bit of noise on the floor here. You can see it's not quite as clean and sharp down at the bottom. A little bit of noise around it. It's just because this isn't the greatest uh, function generator. I mean, it's beautiful for what it's for, but uh, it's got a, a little distortion to it. And if we jump over here to the um, square wave, you'll notice all of a sudden you do start getting some harmonics. <laughs> That's to be expected when you're kind of a square wave or something like this. More importantly, uh, you just got the teeniest little bit of overshot right here, and it picks up real quickly. So I'm really happy with the way this thing turns out. Like I said, again, the slip on these has more to do with uh, the capacitance of the cables I'm dealing with uh, and them not being perfectly matched than anything. So all in all, I'm happy with this thing. I'm going to throw the covers back on it, and we'll wrap this video up. All right, she's back together on the bench. One other thing I did real quick, um, just a tip. I took these front tubes out, uh, these tubes, and I used just a